All right. So as people start filling in, um, I, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all very much for joining us. This is our uh, you know quarterly journal, ASES Journal Club. We, I think we were um, uniquely privileged to have an incredible group of faculty. This is you know a very popular topic, revision shoulder arthroplasty, something that I think all of us um, have have their our own sets of challenges and also sort of uh, very much enjoy. And I think this is going to be a one of the um, uniquely suited ones to learn a lot as there's a tremendous amount to be learned in this area. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us. And uh, thank you very much to Drs. Atwal, Frankel, and Throckmorton for coming and spending their evenings with us, uh, teaching us about uh, one of the more challenging areas of, of shoulder placement. So Chris, you want to sort of introduce us before we go on to the articles? Yeah, I think Steve's going to play a quick uh, presentation from our sponsors. At Smith and Nephew, we strive to put solutions in your hands that can allow your patients to live a life unlimited. And the shoulder space is no different. Here at Smith and Nephew, our focus is on providing you options throughout your patient's continuum of care with cutting edge products like Regenitin, a bioinductive implant that redefines biologic healing for rotator cuff tendon growth. And the new Atos shoulder system starring the Atos Metastem that allows for streamlined procedures and elevated surgical experience and efficiency by helping to simplify TSA and RSA. We are honored to support the ASES Foundation, and it is our mission to continue to provide you with the most innovative solutions in the shoulder space to help restore your patient's ability to live their life unlimited. All right. Fantastic. So, awesome. We're going to do a little, little introduction now. Uh, of our of our esteemed panelists. So, <laughs> all right, so we've got a heavyweight battle tonight. Coming out of Western Ontario, the esteemed George Athwal. Out of Tampa, Mark Frankel. And then our third panelist, Dr. Quinn Throckmorton out of Campbell Clinic. So we're looking forward <laughs> to a great debate tonight. And with that, we'll get started with Eric's first article. Wow, that first punch was thrown pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Back. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Clifton. All right. So the first article we're going to talk about is, is the humeral endoprosthesis article. And this one is uh, dealing with Clifton, uh, stop sharing your screen. Um, the, uh, perfect. Um, the, so this one, um, for those who, those you're familiar. So this one's a retrospective study that looked at 13 patients that underwent a endoprosthesis for massive humeral bone loss. The average age was 68 years old. Many had prior operations. Uh, six had prior tumor procedures or had them done for tumor procedures. Interesting enough, eight of the 13 did have the deltoid insertion preserved. So ultimately, they were limited by the fact that four other patients died before their last fall. But of the nine that survived, 34 months follow up. There's good improvements overall in VS and pain score. Forward elevation, though, is only 81 degrees. So obviously a bit of a limitation. Um, there was a 38% complication rate, perisprostatic infection, uh, perisprostatic fractures, and uh, dislocations with a reoperation rate of 31%. So kind of a, a nice novel study that talks about endoprosthesis, adds to some of the pre previous literature on this area. This is a uh, you know very complicated patient population when you're dealing with this massive humeral bone loss on how to actually manage it and and I think this this highlights the the risk of complications as well as the uh, limitations that, that are often experienced with these patients after the the revision surgery. So it's a kind of a nice foundation for future studies, sort of helping us establish an algorithmic approach in this humeral bone loss. So I'm going to sort of start out and uh, and and. Um, uh, join or I'll bump it to you, Dr. Frankel. So, you know, you published on on um, multiple sort of approaches to humeral bone loss. Do you sort of want to talk to us about um, how you go about deciding your optimal strategy for for making up for humeral bone loss? Is it is it the amount? Is it the the deltoid insertion or maybe the calcar? How do you approach these patients that have pretty significant humeral bone loss in in either a tumor setting or or a revision procedure? Yeah, you know, I don't have much experience uh, in the tumor patients other than patients who have come to me with a 
attempt of a tumor reconstruction that have a, an unstable shoulder. Um, you know, in the past, they would do a hemiarthroplasty. So most of my experience has to do with acquired bone loss from multiple revisions. You know, typically the scenario is hemi for fracture, revision, 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 the subsequent loosening of the implant, and then a, a severe uh, humeral bone loss. So for me, the factors are the amount of bone loss, the soft tissue envelope. Um, those are the major factors I, I, I consider. Um, I used to be a bit more aggressive in using an allograft because I liked the ability to have the tendon attached to the graft. So that gave me some ability to reattach it. But uh, I think now I'm a, I, I want to have greater bone loss than maybe five to eight centimeters at least if I'm going to consider using an APC, which is my preferred way. And if it's less than that, then I would just use a standard implant with trying to upsize the sphere to make up for the soft tissue loss. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Farrar Martin, so what, what is your, uh, how do you algorithmically work up these patients? So when you're trying to optimize stability, as you know, joint stability is one of the big concerns we have. How do you, how do you optimize this on the humoral standpoint when you have these patients that have multiple revisions and, and have a significant amount of humoral bone loss? What, what is your, what is your uh, sort of algorithmic approach? Is it, it the question is how to provide stability. Is that yeah, so how asking? do you, well, how do you make up for the bone loss and provide, and, and, and how do you think about maximizing stability when you're, when you're dealing with these patients? Gotcha. Okay. So uh, algorithmically, I'm not too different than Mark. Uh, there, there is this sort of no man's land between about 15 to 20 millimeters of bone loss and about four centimeters, which is where a lot of the endoprosthetic systems start. And, and uh, I, I am a believer in making up the deficiency with metal. Uh, my experience with APC has not been as, as good as it has been with endoprosthesis. And we, uh, we, we do have do a fair amount of tumor surgery here. So we, we do have a lot of, a uh, fair, amount, fair amount of experience with this. And this, the stability part of it, I actually got from Carolyn Chevley. She's got a great uh, tip where, you know, these are, these endoprosthetic systems, you can build them up. They're sort of like tinker toys. And you don't have to be quite as precise as you do when you're measuring for an APC where you got one chance to make a good cut. And if you don't, if you don't get that right, you got a problem. You can play around with the uh, modular components. But the tip that, um, that Carolyn taught me is that you go up to the tightest, the, the tightest liner that you can put in, wait five minutes, and then put in one size up. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's well, awesome. What's your, what's your May not be an algorithm. It's just what I do. <laughs> well, <what's your> <laughs> I could do something similar. Oh, sorry, uh, George. No, I was just going to say, I do something similar, but uh, I actually cycle it. So I put the, the tight liner in and I cycle the shoulder, let it rest for a few minutes, then go put another one in. Because I find that all that non-structural scar tissue stretches out pretty quickly and you can start moving up the liners pretty fast. So you said you've had pretty good experience with tumor prosthesis. So is your experience better than Dr. Gillespie's here where there's a one-third revision rate? It's about it's about the same. We published on this actually several years ago, uh, and I'm I'm looking at the data. We had a few more patients, but the the um, key difference I think in the outcomes is what was noted in the paper is preservation of the deltoid tuberosity. And and they when I went through it, I didn't really see them stratify out their outcomes, but we did in, in our paper. And actually, if you're able to preserve the deltoid tuberosity. Forward elevation approaches that a primary reverse. You can actually get just a fantastic amount of overhead function uh, despite the despite the bone loss. Once the deltoid tuberosity is gone, I think our average is about 70 degrees. So, I mean, you, you're looking at navel level or chest level of function. Yeah, I would disagree with both of you guys. I think you're both mistaken <laughs> in using metal. Surprise. Um, oh, uh, and I'll, Mark, who are you talking about? I'm my APC. Hey, oh, you said you did what Quinn said. You said you used metal like Quinn. No, you're hearing things. Put your other, <laughs> put your other. Uh, All right, George, to clarify to Frankel, uh, George, or you say, so you, clarify to Frankel, so you're an what is your algorithm? How do you approach these? What's your algorithm? Like so I, I, I would say, you know, the idea that you put it in <laughs> so tight always seemed to me like, uh, you know, it, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense because in general, when we do shoulder surgery, we want to avoid tightness, right? It, 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 you want to try to have stability, but not tight. Sure, no, I agree it, with you there. But what I'm saying so is these patients, they're contracted. 
When, as soon as you're missing hemoglobin bone loss, there's a contraction that occurs. It's the same thing with unstable patients that are dislocated for you know several weeks. They contract. And so I think we're going to talk about the instability paper, but I think it's really important to recreate that height. You don't want to go more than that. But what I find is that you have to measure it out. I think you get pretty close. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. Although I think the difference is um, you, you have to excise the scar that forms, right? So the challenge in, uh, in a multiply revised humeral implant is the bone sort of gets incorporated. It's hard to differentiate it from the deltoid. So you, you have to define that plane between the deltoid and whatever remaining bone that has become ectatic from the loosening of the humeral implant. So to me, that's a key technical thing because if you don't do that, then that scar makes the soft tissues uh, excessively tight and you don't really get muscular contraction. So I, I think that that technical tip is one that um, it's taken me a long time. And it, it's, you know, after they've had five or six revisions, you, you can, you, at some point, you feel like you can't actually define those planes very well. So you just have to do the best you can. But I think those are the ones that are most challenging uh, to do. And I, you know, I would prefer to get my tension instead of, you know, lengthening the arm is lateralizing. But I agree, George. I think you want to try to approach getting the humerus back to normal length, but not excessively, uh, not longer than that. Well, that then, then we're saying the exact same thing. thing. Yeah. Then, then we're not saying anything differently. It's just it, after you revise the scar and do all the things that you've talked about, what you have is this long soft tissue sleeve, which has, which has more, even though it's been contracted, it has a fair amount of elasticity in it, which is different than the native shoulder. So it requires a stretching and then a resting period to sort of accommodate to its new length. And then you're good. Yeah, I we agree. We have a question from Dr. Sanchez Sotelo. So thank you for joining us, Joaquin. And again, if anyone has any questions, throw them in the chat. I'll get them over to Who's the panelists. I don't know him. <laughs> yeah, Paul met him. He's probably do the do three of you always, He says, yeah. do the three of you always try to match the length of the humerus missing based on bilateral scaled x-rays? Not always, but I, I do get scanograms as a way to get me have an idea about where I want to be, um, but not always. Um, so for me, if the tuberosity is missing, I do get bilateral scaled x-rays and I try to match the length within a centimeter. Cause I find if I, if, if I go full length, sometimes that can be very difficult to reduce because and it's not reduced reduction for the length for me. For me, then it turns into this medial lateral stuff. Cause I, I do an ABC, yeah. the tuberosity, and I find sometimes I can't get that underneath the deltoid, probably the scar tissue that you talked about, Mark. Uh, so I tend to go a little bit shorter and then I can build up on uh, spacer polyethylene. And these are the cases that I consider doing a trial of glenosphere. So like, uh, because if I find that, as Quinn said, maybe I went a little bit too short, then I can lateralize. I want to have the option of lateralizing my glenosphere. And I don't want to buy it right away. Yeah, I, 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 I think that I would agree with that, that this is the case that I, I tried. And uh, I think that's helpful because you can make those adjustments if, at the end. Again, I like having the tendon on the, on the allograft because I think that the tendon, the tendon heals fairly well. And, uh, you know, one of the types of bone loss that I've seen is the ectatic humerus where it balloons. And, and what ends up happening is they get a periprosthetic fracture because the bone is so pathologic. And it, it can involve the deltoid insertion. And what I found is if you take that sliver of bone with the deltoid insertion and you attach it, at least in an allograft, it actually heals fairly well. I don't know about that in metal, Quinn. Maybe you can tell me if, if you've had that experience uh, when you use a metal uh, prosthesis. There's always these porous titanium pads that you can sew to, uh, and frankly, I haven't found that particularly rewarding. Like once the um, once the deltoid is off, and, and I've done uh, actually a lot of what you've talked about, like probably trying to preserve that shell of bone with the deltoid tuberosity on it. It it has not healed all that well to, to metal. So it, it so I, in my experience anyway. So it, when when the deltoid tuberosity is gone, I I really don't. Uh, I've, I've not seen, regardless of technique, I've not had any success getting elevation past shoulder level. George, how about you? Have you tried to, because I have a series of those where I, I know for sure that it's healed I, radiographically and they get, they do get restoration of function once that happens. George, how about you? 
exactly what you're talking about. It's usually post-trauma reverse, like a, a reverse done for fracture, where there was yeah. no greater velocity. And what happens is the humeral implant starts rotationally becoming unstable. Yeah. And you get this dilated humerus, and then you get a periprosthetic fracture at the tip of the implant. Um, so what I'll do, like, you know, usually those implants come, I don't care too much about the medial cortex, but if I can, uh, what I'll do is I'll clamshell it and still do the APC. Cause I, I'm a little different than you, Mark. You said, you, you said, uh, if I heard you correctly, that if it's the greater tuberosities involved, you're not so aggressive anymore, but you don't. Yeah, do I, 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 right. I, but uh, when I, part of that was one of the things that I observed early on is the modular implant and Cofield actually keyed into this. You know, if you have a modular implant and the modular implant on the humeral side is below the level of bone loss, then the modular junction is at greater risk to fail. And uh, so early on, I was grafting five centimeters because I had a modular implant and I wanted to have bone protecting that modular junction. Um, and that would include a greater porosity. And, and once we, we did a study showing that if you have a monolithic implant that doesn't have the modular junction, it's much more stable. So I started to use those less because I didn't, so what I then did is I just started upsizing the glenosphere to get that same lateralization. Uh, and I found that to work sufficiently. Uh, so I, I don't, it has to be a bit more bone loss now for me to use an APC. I think for me, if it's, uh, I, I also agree I, with my APC is I try to use a monoblock implant. Uh, and I also try to use a monoblock implant that does not have a cylindrical stem that's, you know, proximally may have, and I find a non-cylindrical stem is much more rotation stable. But the other, but I actually do. If I, if the greater tuberosity is missing, I I I put a little what yeah. I call I put a mini APC on because of uh, yeah. that delta wrapping. And I think I saw Howard Routman's name on here as a as one of the residents paying attention. Uh, but he, I, I think I mean he talks a lot yeah. about delta wrapping, and I actually believe that. I, I think it makes a difference, especially with that medial lateral stability. So. Frank, or Mark, if I'm hearing you right, you're talking about like if the greater tuberosity is gone, you will put in, you'll cement in like a proud humeral stem. Is, is that how you not do it? Not proud because I, I have it at the right height. So you'll just sink proud. it all the way down. I'll just, it'll, it'll be an appropriate height, right? So let's say it's a neck fracture, the surgical neck fracture. So the medial part of the implant would rest there. And if there's no tuberosity, then I won't I won't put a, an APC to restore that tuberosity because I found I really don't need to do that uh, in order to get a, a successful outcome. And sure. but I'll, what I'll do to George's point, not only will I cement in a stem, but I'll also in cement in a stem that has a larger diameter. And again, we another study we looked at was when you when you try to get inherent stability of the stem with bone loss. One way you can do it is you can go longer or you can also incre increase the diameter of the stem is the rotational stability of the implant is related to the radius to the third. But you can use an irregular, like a Wagner type stem too that has rotational stability as George sort of alluded to as well. Um, so that's how I try to deal with it because the one concern is stability of the glenar humor joint. The other one is the concern about repeat humeral loosening because of the loss of structural support of the implant. Yeah, and I guess that's where I'm going because I, I don't think we're talking about proximal humerus fractures as massive glenoid or massive no. bone loss. Yeah, but you're saying that you between five and eight, you're you no, it has to be more four than, centimeters. Yeah, four centimeters. I'll use a, a monoblock. I won't. I won't do that. I I won't do that. I used to. I think the the first paper we wrote it was five centimeters or more. So theoretically, in that paper, we didn't have four centimeters. But five centimeters generally is the level in which all your cuff muscles are involved. So that was my rationale early, plus the, the modular junction. So the first paper, that's the criteria. The, the next series, we I, I because we changed, made those changes, I, I stopped doing it with that amount, but like eight to 10 for sure, you know, I like those cases. It's usually the ecstatic ones that George said though. That's like the classic case for me. We have one question before we go into the next papers from Dr. Cohen. Maybe just go through the panelists real quick. When doing an APC, do you cement the allograft to the stem? Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I try my best to do it all in one step, but usually I find sometimes it's easier to cement the stem into the allograft. And then once that hardens, put that onto the, the native humerus. That's that's the go-to way, but sometimes you can get a home run and get it all pieced together. It's plated and circlaged ahead of time. That's okay. less frequent. Agreed. Awesome. Okay, so we'll go to the next paper. It's the outcomes of femoral head allograft for the management of glenoid bone defects and revision reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This is Dr. Frankel's study. The authors state that revision shoulder arthroplasty often requires management of glenoid bone defects, and they said that options include allograft, iliac crest, and augmented metal components. The purpose of the study was to report outcomes of revision shoulder arthroplasty requiring management of glenoid bone defects with femoral head allograft in a large cohort of patients using a single reverse shoulder implant, which was compared to a matched cohort. Outcomes of the patients who had successful glenoid reconstruction were compared to those that required a re-revision and to a control group that was revised without the need for bone graft. This was a retrospective review. There were 36 patients in the bone graft group, 52 in the control group. All patients underwent revision to reverse shoulder arthroplasty to manage a failed total shoulder arthroplasty hemi-reverse. All patients had a minimum of two years of clinical follow-up the primary endpoint was survival of base plate, flex, base plate fix, fixation. Secondary outcomes included range of motion and functional outcome scores. Patients that had a recurrent base plate failure that were re-revised were compared to patients that had bone graft that did not require an additional surgery and to patients who were re-revised -re without the need for bone graft. Patients who required revisions for reasons other than recurrent base plate failure were also recorded. 14% of patients had recurrent base plate failure. The mean time to failure was 12 months. Three had three of the five had successful implantation of another base plate. Two of the five were revised to a hemiarthroplasty after the failure of their revisions. One patient required revision surgery not related to base plate, base plate failure, and there were no base plate failures in the control group. The authors conclude that the use of femoral head allograft to manage glenoid bone defects in the revision settings produces predictable improvement in functional outcomes that is not inferior to those revised without bone graft. However, they did say that 14% rate of base plate failures did occur. So Dr. Frankel, um, asking for a friend who had J. Levin convinced me that I should use your technique on Friday. Do you have any technical pearls for recreating um, structural or allograft bone graft for glenoid defects? Yeah, you know, we, we just did one of these on uh, Monday. It seems like it was a fairly common thing. And the things I've learned. So one thing is, you know, you want to try to assess the stability of your base plate, whatever system you have, because you have to have some inherent stability with your base plate. So for me, it's a single monolithic screw and base plate. So I can assess the stability relative to the torsional resistance when I fully see the base plate. And it has to be a rock solid, irrespective of anything else. Um, so then the, the other aspects, like I look at the structural graft as a way to try to have backside contact of the base plate so I don't have the bending moment. Um, so I... I that's how I, I use it. I, you know, I, I use Infuse at the host graft junction. Um, uh, I was talking to my new fellows and I said, I, there's a work that uh, Scott Bowden did on BMP2, which is essentially Infuse, which he did on chimpanzees, which shows autograft and BMP2 with allograft are exactly the same in terms of bottle fusions and chimps. So I sort of thought that would be applicable in this. So BMP, getting implant stability. And the last thing I learned is um, I, I use glenospheres now that are larger than the base plate for load sharing. I think the ones that I had failures on, I think I overestimated my confidence and I, I picked the glenosphere that did not have load sharing. And I think that in retrospect, um, I'm, I'm much more aware of trying to use that technique to try to offset some of the load across the fixation surfaces. Awesome. George, um, how do you decide uh, when you need a structural graft versus augments uh, in a revision setting? Like uh, talk us through your, your approach as you're, as you're taking off the, the blend sphere, your, or the base plate, or maybe the, the polyethylene and you're assessing your bone loss at that point. Um, what, what's, what's your big decision making between a structural graft versus, versus augments? So uh, I think, as you know, Eric, I'm a big fan of preoperative planning. So I use a revision planning software. So I'll get a, a CT scan 
uh, they'll manual segment out the implant and so then I'll apply that to the software. So it gives me an idea of the, the bone deficiency and if I'm going to be able to manage it with an augment. Uh, but because of the planning software, you have the augments available. And so my preference is if I can manage it with an augment, I will. Then if I can't, then I'm going to try to use otter graft and an augment. So if the augment's insufficient, then in general, I tend to go to more hybrid technique. And my third would be uh, with the allograft. So allograft is, uh, it's in my spectrum of care, but it's probably more down the line. Uh, am I allowed to criticize this article? <laughs> you, no. you are, if you want to, yes. No. Mark, Mark, you and I are friends, right? It's no, like, I hate your guts. So, you know, this is a, it's a nice article, but it's missing, I mean, you've got a lot of experience here. It's missing a technical section. So you actually didn't go through what you did with your femoral head allograft, right? And so I thought that would have been very helpful. The second thing is um, you, you don't get, with along with the technical session, it would have been nice to go through, you know, what, how big was the structural grafts? Because I couldn't tell if these were uh, Cancellus yeah. grafts. Yeah, well, that, that, they're, they're, they're always somewhat structural. And that criticism about, you know, it's sort of like, how do you quantify the degree of glenoid bone loss? Because, you know, you can have two patients that if you were to use your fancy planning software, you might see the same defect. But in fact, those defects behave quite differently when you're trying to attach the base plate to the glenoid, right? Sure. Not to mention the soft tissue envelopes might be different. And because you're, you're trying to, one, get fixation of your base plate. Two, you're trying to figure out how are you going to tension the soft tissues, right? So you could medialize and use less structural graft and then make up for it with a some way, or you can use some augment. So it's a little harder to answer that question, but I would say that's a valid criticism of, of how to do it. And I couldn't think of a way to quantify. You know, I tried to say, well, these were very, very bad ones, but I don't think that would be very scientific. But stuff like, I mean, I couldn't tell, like it would have been really helpful to say, okay, well, this, cause you video every one of your operations. Too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you've got mm -hmm. video of every one of these allographs going in. So you could have estimated the size at greater than a centimeter. Like that's what have been helpful for me because if, if these are like two and a half centimeter allographs and a large percentage of them are healing, I might ch it might change what I do. It might change my practice. But if these are wafers, okay. three millimeters thick, that's yeah, yeah. not going to change what I'm going to do. Um, so that would have been helpful for me, just getting a, a sense of the, the size of the structural allograph going in. Well, good. My uh, fellows are listening to this call. <laughs> They're listening, uh, so I'm going to have them go back and look at those videos and measure it. They were just a good idea. Thank I'm you. serious. I mean, th th that's. I know. I know. I I'm I'm serious too. I think it's a good idea. Quinn, can you talk about the use of uh, of, of allograph versus autograph in your your revision practice, um, or or just how how you're approaching these big glenoid deficiencies, uh, uncontained defects? I think I'm just going to lay here on the mat. <laughs> Well, I'm not, I mean, if you're going to give me more time, I'm not done yet. I still have no, I ain't done. I'm okay. ready to go. Uh, so lines have been drawn here. You know, Mark likes bone graft. I, I prefer metal for essentially all, all my defects. And so I, I will augment the glenoid uh, as far as can be done with uh, off the shelf components. And if you're dealing with massive glenoid bone loss and with it, there's we have some we have a study out there about the amount of bone loss that you can have, and I know it's for a, a single implant. And Mark has gotten in my grill about this before, where you can't conflate that with all center screw type implants. But nevertheless, there's sort of a degree of bone loss beyond which anybody would agree that off the shelf components are unlikely to be helpful or unlikely to work on their own. And once we're beyond that threshold, I just go to a patient meshed implant. That's more, more Maybe more just to end. So these all yeah, have good. hard, difficult healing rates. You know. Uh, yeah, I, can I ask a question about... though? Of, uh, oh, please go ahead. Eric, I have a question for my two uh, esteemed moderators. Um, so one of the challenges, um, and why I like using allograft, it doesn't matter. Allograft really doesn't really matter. Is how do you assess the stability of your implant? Like, what are the keys? Like George, you said you use a, a, an augmented implant. So when you're putting that base plate in, whether it's a screw or a post, how do you assess the inherent stability of that? And the same thing back to you, Quinn, because to me, that's the make or break thing. It, because if you don't have inherent stability when you put in the implant, irrespective of whatever it is, I don't 
I have a hard time imagining that would be a successful strategy. No, I think it's a very good point. I think with, with the preoperative planning software, it helps me because I'm going to position the implant, right? And so I'm going to get an idea of what length of my central screw. So if I choose to use a central screw, what length of my central screw is going to be in, in bone? And you have variable size lengths of screws. And also, I can, and if I have an extended post, which is a porous extended post, I know that, you know, maybe 10 millimeters is going to be. So that gives me an idea before I get to the opera room that I'm, I'm going to have enough bone available to get some more medial fixation of the vault. In the opera room, I think it's a composite. I think, uh, and, and you've taught me this, it has a lot to do with the, the how hard it is to turn the central screw if you're choosing to use a central screw, that bite that you get. And same with your peripheral screws. If you use uh, compression peripheral screws and you get into good bone. Um, with the extended post, for me, on, honestly, what it is, is I, I impact the post in and then I just kind of pull it and tug it out. And a lot of times if the whole glenoid comes in out with me, I'm not fully seated, that, that's usually a good sign. But those are also the cases I have to be very careful not to fracture the glenoid because if it's if it's sitting a little bit proud and still got great fixation, I have to be careful. Uh, but it is, there's no, um, I think, objective criteria. I mean, uh, greater than 10 millimeters of post in bone would be good. Greater than 50% of your screws in host bone and greater than 50% backside seating is kind of a, um, a, a loose guideline that I would use. How about you, Quinn? How do you assess? I know with the VRS, it has screw fixation too. So how do you assess that inherent stability? Is it similar? Uh, yeah, I mean, with, with a off the shelf component, I think it's a, a, as a center screw guy, I don't really think it's much different than, than what you do. I want to put the center screw in and see the base plate and the scapula move as a single unit when I ratchet down on that. And to me, that's pretty good objective evidence of stability. When you go to when you go to uh, patient matched implants, it's a it's, it's a little bit trickier because you're just you're just dropping that thing into the defect. My experience with those is that, is that I've gotten a pretty good center screw bite, and I'm always careful about not trying to overcook it in a massive glenoid bone loss case, so I don't really hog down on it the way that I might otherwise. But you can get to the point where you see the, the component and the scapula moving as one. If you do that, I think it's good. So, hey, Mark, one last okay. question about this. Can I ask you a question now? You talk about yes. bone sharing of the glenosphere. Now, yeah. So what you're telling me is, so I just so I understand this. So you put your base plate in, you have your yep. bone graft that's larger, and you're yep. matching up the bone graft perfectly so that it no, how is the it can't be perfect. Rest? No. So how can you approach it? Because you're matching up the because it be, yeah. So it, it impacts so the graft or whatever host is 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 thawed. So when you, you have to make sure you engage the taper because what you're trying to do is you're impacting the graft even more with the rim of the glenosphere. And you can see it. I mean, I, I've had several videos where you I can show you exactly, you can see the bone deform as the peripheral portion of the glenosphere is impacting into the bone. So that's one way to know, but it, it, you have to ensure the taper is engaged because the way you're in getting that fixation is the taper. So after I impact the glenosphere and I see it deform, I'll make sure I'll check my taper engagement because that's one of the risks of doing that technique. But you know, I, I found that to be like, that's the technique I use, plus you know, trying to find the alternative spine line. I, I guess I have a question for both of you guys. So when you're confronted with glenoid, massive glenoid bone loss and you do whatever you do, how then do you, does that change how you tension the glenohumeral joint? For, for me, it does. So if I have a massive glenoid bone loss and I'm going to prepare to do, uh, my goal is always to get a, a reverse in, a total reverse. And if I can't, I usually tell my patients they're going to end up with a, a hemi reverse. Now there's those in-between cases where I'm a little bit concerned about my glenoid base plate stability. What I'll do is I'll actually put in my humeral component, my polyethylene, just a little bit looser. So it's a little bit looser, so it's less stress on the glenoid base plate. And I also use, I increase the neck shaft angle. So I go from 135 to 145, so I can get more containment and use a retentive poly. So I will increase the neck shaft angle, decrease the tension, increase the retentive nature. And what that does, that hopefully provides me the stability. And I tell these patients ahead of time, I would rather get your glenoid reconstruction heal and have to revise you for instability 
then me put it in tight like I'm supposed to put it in and then rip out the glenoid again. And then we've already had a tenuous situation. I've made it worse. So I agree. I would agree with that. Quinn? Same. Not much to add. I put, it, I put it in a little bit looser. I don't really change the next shaft angle much. It's something to consider, but uh, I, I agree. You just err yeah. on the side of stability. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't do that with the next shaft angle, but I do, I do err on making them looser, and I tell them that they might be unstable, but I'd rather go back and revise it. And I've had two of those patients that that's what happened. And it was not, you know, going, I went back, I think in about three months and the, it was solid and I had no problem upsizing the glenosphere. There's a perfect transition. Sorry, there's a perfect transition to the next, next, uh, next uh, article actually. So the next article is on revision for instability. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Frankel can uh, speak on this experience, but let me summarize it very quickly. So 36 revisions for instability, 14 um, failed primaries, 22 failed revisions, uh, minimum 12 month follow-up at the end, 20 or 32 of 36 patients, uh, required 38 revisions to achieve stability. And, and overall, when you looked at the failed primaries, ultimate stability was achieved in 93%. With an average of three procedures, um, the looked at the failed revision subgroup. The ultimate stability was achieved in 86% of patients, so a statistically lower percentage, with an average of 4.5 procedures to, to achieve stability. Ultimately, the biggest reason that um, stability was not able to be achieved was loss of compression, either from the size of the component or deltoid dysfunction. Um, the locked dislocations had lower rates of, of uh, being able to achieve stability than those that had the sort of recurrent instability um, uh, indications. And ultimately, when you revise both components, you had a higher rate of achieving stability versus doing e either the humerus or the glenoid. Um, interesting enough, ultimately, 20 of 21 of 24 with greater than two years of fall remained stable with good clinical outcomes if stability was achieved. So this is a great article, builds upon a, a, uh, a previous one out of Rothman that sort of um, uh, highlights how difficult stability can be, but also if you can achieve it, how, how you can get pretty good outcomes. Um, it shows that uh, there's many different ways. One of the unique things about this is it talks about the different reasons for, for lack of stability or difficulty in obtaining, uh, obtaining stability, both in the primary and revision setting. Um, as a loss of compression is mainly the driving force. And it's a great really foundation as we sort of um, deal with this problem more and more, particularly in the revision setting, but also in primaries as we're sort of adjusting our, our ultimate tension, trying to decide what is the best tension. So, you know, Dr. Frank, I'm, I'm going to let you lead this off since, since this is, this is, this, these are your patients and this is your data. Um, can you talk to us about what did you learn from looking back at this, or maybe throughout your career as as you're as you're uh, revising these patients? Um, what were some of the things that you um, uh, changed either in the primary revision setting when you're dealing with these unstable patients? Yeah, um, well, what I learned is each of these patients, in a, in of themselves, were complicated. So the I wanted to distinguish it from the Rothman paper because the majority of those patients were patients that had a primary reverse that then was unstable. There was, I think there was 10 or 15 of those patients in my, in my cohort. My cohort was, had a primary, had a revision, had another revision. And, you know, by the time they came in, they had four revisions for instability and were dislocated for six months. So I was like, well, this population is not the Rothman group. This is the population. And I was really trying to find when is it the time when you say, you know what, this is a problem that I'm not sure I have a solution for. Um, and I was sort of surprised because some of these patients that were currently in my thoughts and not positively, <laughs> because I never quite figured, I could not quite understand exactly why. So what I learned is, if I clearly can understand what I think is the reason why their shoulder is dislocated, then I have a very high chance of making them stable. So the classic one is a reverse for a fracture. The tuberosity was left behind or a failed hemi, and now they impinge on that tuberosity to come out. If you see that on an x-ray, if you see that piece of bone in the back, to me, that's a high likelihood you're going to get them stable because you excise the bone and you can adjust your 
your components to get adequate tension. The other ones are a little harder because as George said, so now they've been dislocated for six months or whatever, how long they've been out. So the primary problem is they're scarred and you don't quite know, well, why, what caused them to dislocate in the first place, right? Because you, you have to work like crazy just to get the scar out, just to reduce the shoulder. And they seem a lot tighter than, than what you thought, right? And so you, you, you're trying to say, well, was this someone that was undersized that was dislocated and left dislocated and now is scarred? And if I don't go up, if I don't upsize, they're gonna just re-dislocate because I never solved the initial problem. So some of those are challenges. The last one we did, uh, like again, this is not common in my life. Um, that was, you know, my fellow who's just leaving. I I was clear, I wanted to go up it, to Glenister's and it was tight. So I had to work really hard to get the scar out so I could upsize and uh, we did. And I thought that that had a high likelihood of being successful. But, you know, I, I was trying to find something that could communicate like what I did learn in a, in an easy sound bite. And I was sort of disappointed uh, that I really couldn't find that with our data. I really couldn't say, you know, this, these are the ones that really suck. Um, I, I was sort of surprised some of the ones I thought would do a lot worse, you know, the ones that are chronically dislocated, I couldn't quite show that. Um, so that was what I learned. I'd be interested to hear George and Quinn's experience because I'm sure they also have dealt with this population. Yeah, Quinn, so can you expand upon that? So you have uh, a patient coming in, let's say it's just a, a, a primary reverse that then dislocates, so not for fracture. Um, can you just talk about how you go about first evaluating and then and then eventually uh, deciding one, both components, like your, your, your approach to that patient? Yeah, and we have this sketched out in an, in an algorithm, and it, it's by no means like inviolate but in, in general a first-time dislocator gets a trial at a closed reduction and this is where it gets into the whole i, I tell the patients it's 50 percent, no matter which way you slice it 50 percent chance that closed reduction will work 50 percent chance that'll fail if it fails you're going to surgery 50 percent of those will work on the front end 50 of those 50 percent of those will fail and i think that lines up pretty well with what with mark's uh data suggests because a lot of these folks need multiple procedures in order to become stable if they fail a closed reduction, there's a standard battery of tests that we get, which is a CT arthrogram to look for uh, component loosening, component placement. We get an EMG because I want to know what the axillary nerve stand, uh, looks for, and then a, a, a course an infection workup. So depending on all of those, then if you're going to go to, to surgery, I, I, I like Mark's uh, approach a lot. And I think we've evolved a great deal where it's no longer just make the construct longer. You know, any of us that were doing this 10 years ago, you know, we had people that we had lengthened and their hand was dragging on the floor, but they were still unstable, right? So we finally got to the point where uh, where we, we recognized deltoid wrap. And I agree that Howard Routman has a great point here. So I'll expand the glenosphere, go as big and wide as I can, try to get the soft tissue tension right with lateralization on the humeral side. And then I'm pretty quick to, to lateralize even more to, to get deltoid wrap where people either put like an allograft humeral head on the greater tuberosity, or you can put a tr metal tray out there that'll help give you a little bit more deltoid wrap as well. And and I'm very quick to go to constrained liner as well. So that's awesome. a lot of stuff. That's awesome. So you highlight a bunch of, George, you want to add on to that? So maybe uh, tips that you have both to figure out the cause um, and, and maybe some of these more, more, less, less clear um, cases. And then, uh, and then, and then ways to, in addition to some of the things that Quinn pointed out, ways to optimize not having to come back a second or third time. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, I've heard Joaquin say this, something called uh, revision light versus revision complex. And so I actually have a very similar approach to uh, Quinn there. I try a closed reduction. I usually try it in clinic. Uh, a lot of times it actually works in clinic. So if it works in clinic, that's not necessarily a good thing. That means it's, I'm, I may be revising them sometime soon, or we get the residents to do it in the emergency department. Um, and then when I look at, I look at the x-rays and a CT scan, and I try to figure out why this dislocated was the, I mean, Bob Tajna has shown us if you have the glenoid, a glenosphere superiorly inclined, that can lead to instability. Is there ectopic bone? Can I find a reason? If I can find a reason, usually that makes me happy uh, because we know we can correct that. But when you can't find a reason similar to Mark, then you're a little bit worried where you're going to go in there. Um, and so with revision light, if everything, if all the implants, the humeral implants look good and the glenoid implants look good, that's when I'm going to do like a bipolar operation. They're typically going to get a larger sphere or a more lateralized sphere. Oh. 
And on the humeral side, I'm typically going to go hopefully thicker on the polyethylene and a more retentive. If it's revision complex where one of the, there's a problem on one side of the implant or the other, you know, the humerus is placed too low and that frequently happens in reverse refractor. The tuberosities are missing, so the implant gets cemented or placed lower, so you decrease tension. So those are the patients you want to get your x-rays, make sure the length is recreated. Uh, or the, the, the base plate was placed too high, or there's impingement, uh, and then you have to deal with one side or the other. So eccentric spheres, taking the base plate out, or go ahead, uh, you know, pull a humeral component, which would be awful, or try to elevate the humeral component. Uh, I mean, Mark's got a great paper, and I don't think it's this one, but the one that you talk about, Mark, where you have uh, loss of containment, uh, loss of compression, yeah. and what was the other one? Yeah, like, it, it's loss of compression and impingement. And yeah. it, so the it made, process, it just made them rhyme that I remember. And I can't, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, they, uh, so this paper was like sort of a follow up because I wanted to have more clinical data. Um, and I was trying to see if I could again sort of come up with the ones that are uh, more of the bad actors. Um, and ultimately, I think the ones that failed were the ones, like you said, I couldn't really figure out what the problem was. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm sort of been su pretty surprised that generally those people, once you get them stable, they actually have a fairly good functional outcome. Um, you know, they, they, they actually do pretty well with their function, which was a, a, a surprise. Um, uh, so I think if those are patients, there's some reason to go for it, even though you might need one or two surgeries, because if you ultimately succeed, they usually will have above shoulder level function. Might, maybe not great strength, but they usually have a score in the high 60s or, or low 70s. I have a group of patients, not a large number, but that where I've done multiple, multiple operations on trying to get them. I have a few patients where I just couldn't make them stable. Everything I did, yeah. they dissipate. Yep. I was wondering if you had that where, you know, I have two yep. patients, I have, one, yep. 11 times to try to make her stable, and I just couldn't. So I just took everything out. Yeah, I didn't take everything out I, because they're not painful. The ones I have left, they're not painful. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've had a couple like that where I'm like, okay, well, I, I don't think I can do anything more. I, I think I, I don't think I did 11 though. That That's a little heroic, but there is a time early, where you, that was, that was you like try. One of my patients. It was early on in practice. I thought, you know, I'm reading all these books and everyone's telling me I can make this stable. And I have a recent patient that, I actually, he's an alcoholic and I think this is his third operation. So I just decided to leave him dislocated. He's 80 something years old and yeah. pain-free and dislocated. So he's, uh, he's out yeah. there. He might show up in your uh, yeah. clinic. So yeah. are there tips well, for these patients that are, that are continuing to dislocate? You know, Bob Tajan talked about the, uh, the uh, cerclage that he's, he's, he's yeah. doing for patients. Um, you can do other everything, tips that y'all have for these patients that continue to dislocate I, that you're, you're trying maybe the last time is your third shot or the fourth shot. Like, what are you doing for these patients? I, I, and this patient, I've had a couple where I actually did double cerclage with tapes and it failed. Uh, and then I, uh, I pretty much tried everything as some patients in this, the most recent patient, basically I converted it to a hemi and then what I did is I put suture anchors, what was left in the humeral shaft, and I sutured it to the conjoint tendon so it wouldn't come out the front anymore. So basically, how did that work? So far, it's still in joint. But I didn't want the last thing I wanted to do is it to because there was minimal soft tissue, just work its way out through my incision. So I actually sutured him in internal rotation, essentially from his lesser to his conjoint to keep him in. One, one additional point is we talk a lot about the contracture that can happen with these chronic dislocations. There's been a few times where uh, recessing the pec tendon has, I, I think, made the difference, where the pec has yeah. this anterior pull on the shoulder. So I'm pretty aggressive about taking down a pretty good share amount of the pec to try and make them stable. I think that helps. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Quinn. I, I've had that happen where it, it was clear to me, because I like repairing the pec, because I like when I'm done to have all the structures. And there was one when I went back in, I realized that I, I just released it and that helped. The other thing, you know, I think the glenosphere size, uh, so I, I guess this is um, probably okay to say. So, you know, the, my first experience with this was um, in 2011 and I had a patient and I 
wanted to make a larger glenosphere. So I had uh, the company make a custom implant, which probably I shouldn't talk about custom implants. I've had some of the not such a good history with re revealing those things. But so I, we did that and the, that then allowed us to stabilize shoulders. So more recently, I went up even one size larger on a patient that I thought I just didn't have a large enough sphere. And, and so that's, you know, that's eight month follow up on that patient. So I'm not, uh, that's not two years, but that's the other way. You know, we, we think that the implant choices we have should solve all of our problems. But I, I think some of these problems are so difficult to sort out that, again, it, it, it's worthwhile to consider having like a, a custom implant to help you. But, you know, you have to try to do something first. So that wouldn't be my first thought, but that's also a, an option. When you, when you see last... here, what, what, how large was large? Like what, what millimeter? Uh, it's a 48 millimeter diameter and it's 10 millimeters offset. So it's 34 millimeters in height. All right, awesome. So before we go to the last one, some guy named Joaquin asked another question. Are there cases where you cannot implant a reverse even with VRS and your best option is a hemiarthroplasty when? Maybe we'll start with you, Quinn. Um, yeah, I, I think that those, I think those um, uh, patients exist. And in, in my world, it, it falls into two things. Number one, they get a VRS and it fails. Uh, I've uh, knock on wood not had that happen yet, but I know they're coming. Uh, the other is um, is uh, when they like patients that are too old or too sick, where I offer them a VRS and they say no, or or you know it's just not worth it to them to go through two surgeries and all that hassle, and they're just too infirm for more intervention. So those folks, uh, I go to a hemiarthroplasty, and frankly, I've been pretty impressed with their outcomes. They get pretty predictable shoulder level forward elevation and strength isn't good, but they do better than I thought that they would. What about you, George? And for me, it has to do a lot with the patient age and, and functional, what their expectations are. So in a younger person with, uh, uh, and a more active person with severe glenoid bone loss, where I, I actually would consider doing a staged hemi reverse. So I've, uh, especially if they have, uh, if they have maintained humeral bone stock, so I can contain the humerus on the glenosphere. Um, in an older patient, that I mean, uh, it's still an option to do a hemi reverse. I've had good success that we've actually published that on JSC in JSCS. Uh, but in patients that are missing the humerus, then I'd probably more likely to go to a humeral hemi arthroplasty. But I've been very happy with uh, glenoid sided hemi arthroplasty. How about you, Dr. Frankel? Yeah, not a fan. I'm not a fan of hemi arthroplasty. Um, so I, I would be, I wouldn't ever not do it as a final salvage, but uh, it's not something I would typically do. Uh, I can't think of a hemiarthroplasty I did for a salvage probably in five years easy. Um, so I would try everything other than that. So what do you, what, what would you do? So you, you go in there, the glenoids, there's nothing left of the glenoid. Well, I don't know what nothing left is. So I, I, I've been, um, Put your screw in. Surprise. Race. If I can't get a bite with a screw, then yes. But that's really, really rare. That's what I'm saying. It's rare. I mean, you know, it might be that when you look at the construct, it's anavert at 40 degrees, but that's not been a problem because you use the alternate spine line. Well, well based on your femoral head allograph paper, it is an issue because you had a bunch of failures. Well, I had, that was a small number and that was failed total shoulders with poly. You're just mean. You're just I read the mean paper. Guy. We're talking about the paper. You said it's not a problem. In your own paper, you said it's a problem. No. Just well, to get I, it. in, in those patients, there were two that I converted to hemis, and those were two people that had an infection. All right. Did you say you converted to hemi? Those yes. were two. Like, when look at the time period of when those were done, George. That was back when you had hair. No, I'm just having fun. <laughs> I, read, I read all the paper. I'm just... Like, I don't read the papers usually for Journal Club, but I read them all, so. <laughs> on that note, let's do our last paper for real quick. This has been awesome. Um, okay, so I'm just going to briefly do the single versus two-stage revision shoulder periprostatic infection. I'm just going to go over the results because the best part is you all talking. So they had looked at 13 studies, 30 studies report, or 13 on single stage, 30 on two-stage. 
The majority of positive cultures were found in single stage revisions, which were siacnes, which is about 50%, and about 33% were reported on siacnes for two stage. There was a lower percentage of methyl and uh, MRSA um, positive cultures for the single stage at 2.5% versus the, uh, the two stage at 9.7%. The reinfection rate was 6.3% for a single stage versus 10.1 for a two stage, um, but it was not significant. These results showed that the single stage should be more effective than two stage, but is likely confounded by the treatment bias given the higher propensity of, of more severe organisms and drug resistant bacteria for the two stage. They concluded that shoulder surgery during PJI can be restored on the low recurrence rates when using a single stage um, uh, uh, repl uh, the revision for infection. So uh, uh, Quinn, what, what's your algorithm for one versus two stage for um, infections? I think it's pretty well spelled out there. I mean, uh, if I if I have a pre-op evaluation that gives me a, a highly virulent organism like MRSA, then to me, I, for me, that's a two stage. I try to one stage as much as I can, though. Like, I, not just this paper, but I think you know Mark's paper on, on infection with a lower infect reinfection rate with a one stage. I, I stand on that as much as possible. And C acne is a pretty wimpy bug. You know, you can run a bunch of napalm through the shoulder and nuke it real good, and and usually putting components in the same um in, in the same setting it without a bug on the front end i i rely on intraoperative evaluation and you know it's using the force you know if i deem the op, if i deem the infection bad <laughs> however however the that strikes me that day then i'm pretty quick to two stage if it's something that i think i can clean out and, and get sterilized in one setting i'll go to one stage that's awesome. So, uh, George, how are you? Uh, so, one of the keys to this is understanding what the bug is ahead of time. But as you know, like aspirations often are dry or not not always so so helpful. In that, um, how are you deciding the one stage versus two stage? How are you getting bug and and are you using any aspect of intraoperative decision making to make this decision? So, I mean, it's uh, so I still do blood work uh, and I do uh, synovial biopsies using interventional radiology. Um, and then hopefully I'll find an organism that time. If not, it all depends on, I guess, the nature of the revision. So, um, if it's some a revision where I want to try to maintain one of the implants, so it's a revision for, let's just imagine it was for humeral ASAP or loosening of the humeral component where the glenoid's in perfect position, but I'm not sure if this is just aseptic loosening or effective and all the blood works negative. In those patients, I'd actually do arthroscopic biopsies still. So I'll go in there and take five to seven samples. I'll, uh, I'll probe, look for metallosis, look for reasons for failure. And the reason I like to do that is I want to, I want to preserve my glenoid base plate. Um, in, in in cases where it's obviously infected using the criteria developed by the ASCS, uh, in those cases, um, I'll, I'll you know go do a resection and antibiotic spacer. In general, I'm still I lean towards a two stage. Uh, my indications for for one stage are would be C acnes, uh, maybe an, an elderly, uh, more frail patient. I'll do a one stage. I probably should be more aggressive with one stage, and that's uh, probably something. Uh, uh, by reading the papers, I should probably do a little more of one stage procedures. So, you know, I think the difficulty is uh, assessing the adequacy of your debridement. So to me, when I'm trying to decide uh, if I'm gonna put a spacer or if I'm gonna do a one stage reimplantation, the first thing I do is I have to be critical of my ability to do a thorough debridement. Sometimes, uh, especially if there's a lot of associated polyethylene wear, it could be difficult because it, it doesn't wall itself off so well. So, you know, you, you especially when you have that metallosis, the stuff seems to go everywhere. So if I don't feel I can get almost all of that out, that might sway me one way or the other. The other thing is, if I'm going to do a, a re-implantation of a reverse, I have to have just complete rock solid stability on both sides. So I, you know, that means I might cement in the humeral stem. I need to make sure there's no motion at the interface. So those are my criteria. So because some of the infections, you know, there's so much bone loss that it's hard to know, like because you, you keep debriding and then you're not sure if you take it out too much. So those are cases where, you know, I'll, I will use a spacer, but they're not, they're not as common because I've been more aggressive because I'm 
I, I've had a similar recurrence rate with the uh, one stage revision of about 6%, which I think is pretty reasonable. Mark, Mark, if you have, let's say you have a well fixed base plate, uh, what, yeah. do you do in that, what do you do in that circumstance? So you want to do your one stage revision and you, you have a yeah. perfect base, but you don't want to I, take it. Yeah, so I'll tell the patient in, the, in those cases, I'm going to um, keep the implant in even though there might be a chance for increased recurrent infection because I retained that implant. But I'll, I'll take out, like in the base plate, I'll take out the, the screws. I'll make sure there's absolutely no motion. There's no fibrous in growth. And then I'll, I'll put new screws in and I will do that. And, but I have a discussion with them ahead of time because there's probably, uh, we, in our first series, we, we talked about a one stage reimplantation, meaning we retained part of the implant and that group had a higher recurrence rate than if you take everything out and you start again. Um, but I, I will make that concession and I'll have that discussion. You know, if it's a well-fixed implant that I'm not so keen to take out or the other side might be loose. I, I, you, you find if, you, if they have a positive biopsy that that helps you decide if you're going to take that thing out or not, George? Uh, if they have a, and I guess for me, it depends on the organism. So for me, if it's, any and this is maybe I, I should be falling a little short, but if it's anything other than C actinase, I get a two stage. What if it's your set, your biopsy is negative? Okay, so but, and so like they're like a total shoulder biopsy negative. Do I like do they draining or there's so many uh, scenarios? No, yeah, let's say they're draining, or? yeah, they're draining, not, not a total, let's say reverse, well fixed base plate, numerous looks loose. They're draining, but you do a biopsy, it's negative. Yeah. And so, I mean, um, I still do the blood work. I do ESR, C-reactor protein. Okay. Younger, more active patient, I would, I go in there and I usually take things out. Rip out that fix. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I still struggle. Yes. I have that discussion. Sometimes How you about can. you, Quinn? Yeah. So. If the, you take if you're talking about it's well taking fixed. the stem out, but the glenoid is well fixed, or or, or or other way around, or the humerus is well fixed and the glenoid is loose, or one okay. of the components is fixed. Yeah, if if it's an acute infection, uh, meaning you know within a couple of weeks, which we don't see too many of those, but if it's an acute infection, then yeah, I, I think uh, yeah. I think the dare procedure is appropriate. Uh, if um, if it's more than that, and if, if it, the scenario you're talking about where the wound is draining and it's more of a chronic thing, I, I'm, well, I have a hard time thinking you can sterilize that. Yeah. I mean, it's just trying to decide how, you know, especially if it's a well fixed humeral ingrowth stem. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it has so you're, age. So if, yeah. if the, the older they are, the lower demand, the more sedentary they are, the more likely I am to do, leave those implants in, do an aggressive irrigation to bribe it flip as many ones that are easy to exchange. And I actually put them, honestly, I tell them, you're on your cholesterol pill, you're on your antihypertensive, and now you're going to take this little antibiotic pill for the rest of your life too. And they're- well, and I tell them they get one shot at that. I said, if we do this and your wound heals, great. But if you keep draining, then we're going to have to take everything out. But I, I preface that by explaining the morbidity involved in taking out a well-fixed implant. Yep. All right, we have one question out here from Chris Cosalanti. How often and in what setting, if any, are you performing a DARE procedure rather than a one stage? What the hell is a DARE procedure? Yeah, I don't know procedure. It's, it's debridement and implant retention. So it's, it's what we were just talking about where, uh, or at least what I was saying, where infection within two weeks, wash everything out, change the poly, be done. What the, what the heck? What, what the heck is a DARE? What the heck? The heck. <laughs> this is the we're sponsored by ASCS here and Smith and Nephew, so you got to keep it keep it cool. PG PG. I've already failed that. I already got the merit. So thank you, George, keeping me in line, looking after you. But I, I think you know. I don't know how frequently I would do it, but I think we've all discussed this scenario. Well fixed implant, and for me, I if I think I can adequately debride it. I will tell the patient we are going to try, and uh, I, I tell them there's probably about uh, a one out of five chance that they're going to have a recurrence, and we're going to have to take everything out. Uh, 
I'm doing one on Thursday. It's a patient of mine. I did an allograft prosthetic composite reconstruction. Uh, it was probably about six weeks ago. Uh, she dislocated. And now about a week ago, she started to develop a draining sinus on the inferior aspect of her room. So she's going back to the OR for basically aggressive irrigation, debride, and poly exchange, retentive, and IV antibiotics and probably suppressive antibiotics for the rest of her life because she's going to have a big chunk of allograft that's probably infected. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. That sucks. My Thursday morning. Absolutely. Well, thank you all very much. This has been incredible. Love the banter. Love the uh, wisdom. Um, and uh, and really, thank you all for spending your evenings with us. Um, this will be recorded. It will be posted will be on posted. the uh, website. Um, please, anybody reach out to me if you, you don't know where to find these, these previous recordings. And um, we look forward to you all joining us in, in about three months from now. So thank, thank you very much, Drs. Uh, Atwal, Thrakman, and Frankel. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank Enjoy you, guys. It. That was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Have a good night. Sure. Bye. Chris, thank good you night. so much. It was a great honor. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.